Okay, so today we are going to continue with the topic of networks on chip. Uh, as I mentioned last time, uh, the overall flow of the lecture as well as the majority of the figures over here are uh, uh, courtesy of Professor Anand Raghunathan at Purdue University. What we are going to do today is go into each of these different characteristics and the matrix that we had mentioned last time, which are in some way representative or some way that you can use in order to measure or understand the different kinds of problems that arise when using networks on chip. Okay. So the first one which we briefly looked at last time was with regard to topology. By topology we just mean how the different nodes in the network are laid out and connected to each other. Okay. So this is literally the physical or at least the logical connectivity between the different nodes. right? Uh, what that means is that the sizes of the nodes or the lengths of the lines that are used in order to draw these links between them may not be exactly coinciding with what happens on the actual silicon system, but these are the actual connections that exist. right? So for example over here we have a two dimensional mesh, there are nine nodes. In this case, in general, when I talk about nodes, a node is something that's doing some kind of computation, right? And the links are just some way by which I can get data from one node to another. In practice, what will happen is the nodes might be of different types of capabilities. One might be a processor, another one might be an FFT block, which is highly specialized. Another one might be an FIR filter, another one might be matrix multiplication, right? But we don't care. All that we care is there is each node is capable of doing computation and we need to be able to transfer data from one node to another. The torus is an extension of the 2D mesh that makes it easier to communicate from one end to the other logically, right? but physically as we can see it means that you need long wires which might lead to other kinds of problems. A three dimensional hypercube is in some ways better because it provides additional connections between nodes. But once again, how do you actually realize this on physical silicon is a different question. Right? Another way of looking at the topologies could be like this. One common topology is when you have a large number of computational elements just connected together in a ring. Right? The octagon is one which tries to provide sort of shortcut connections between things that are otherwise far apart and therefore reduce the maximum distance that a packet might or that data might need to flow. Okay. And a crossbar is sort of the best case where every node is directly connected to every other node, which means that the latency required for communicating data from one node to another is minimum. But on the other hand, the sheer number of links that you now need to lay out in hardware on silicon will probably make this impractical except for very specific small cases. Okay. So this much we saw last time. Let's go a bit further and understand what are some metrics that we might use in order to actually quantify what the usefulness of a particular topology is. So in particular there are a few different terms that come up. One is called the bisection bandwidth. There are other things called the node degree and the node diameter which we will go into in a little bit more detail now. So before understanding that we need to sort of look at bus structures and understand what we mean when we are talking about bottlenecks. Okay, So this is the case of a regular shared bus, the original, before we started off with a network on chip. Right? And as you can see over here, the blue curve, the blue line, uh, highlighted line sh shown in the upper part of the figure, essentially shows you the best case latency. You can think of it as best bandwidth or best latency because primarily what we are saying is if I want to transfer X amount of data, how quickly can I get it from node 2 to node 6 in this case or the other way around. Okay. Now why I am calling this the best case is the entire bus bandwidth is available to me. So node 2 can at every clock cycle be transferring data and all of it will be being received by node 6. The problem is what happens when multiple communication channels are required at the same time. right? We did discuss one possibility of having a so called shared bus or a split bus where for example if one was talking to two and three was talking to four, they might potentially be able to talk without interfering with each other. 
But right now, if you have communications of this sort, one is talking to five, two to six, three to seven, and four to eight, this part over here becomes a bottleneck. Right? And you can see that if that link is capable of carrying, let's say, one million packets per second, then depending on the priority, the sort of best case, sort of fairest scenario is that 1, 2, 3 and 4 each receive 250 kilo packets per second throughput on that, right? Which means that at any given point in time, the latency effectively of transferring X amount of data has gone up by a factor of 4. A crossbar is in some ways better in the sense that what is happening inside this block over here is that it actually allows us to make any arbitrary connection from the left side to the right side. So one can be connected to five, two can be connected to six, all can happen at the same time. So it gets rid of that problem of the shared bus. The problem now happens when everybody is trying to talk to the same destination. right? So let's say one, two, three, and four are all trying to talk to eight, then that becomes an issue even with a crossbar. Is this unrealistic? Possibly, but not too unrealistic because just think of eight as the main memory of the system, right? If that was the case, then everybody is very likely to be trying to talk to eight, right? Getting data into or out of eight. What about a two dimensional mesh structure, right? Again, because you have all of these links, in principle, 1 to 4, 2 to 5, 6 to 7, well, 8 to 9 in this case, all of them can happen at the same time in parallel, right? The bottleneck would come up in this situation where let's say that many of them are trying to talk to 6, right? Now, 6 to 7, the 7 to 6 is still open. That has not been hit by a bottleneck. But the other links, 5 to 6, 4 to 6, and 8 to 6 are all contending because of the way that the packets were being routed or the way that the data was being routed, right? But what this shows you is, if I look at this alternative, right, which achieves the same purpose, they are all able to talk to 6, right? But they are able to talk through different ports on the interface that 6 has, okay? So obviously, this is at a very high abstract level of description that I am talking about. The underlying assumptions are that 6, whatever communication infrastructure it has, it has multiple ports through which it can receive or transmit data. In this case, there are four ports. And what we are saying is, how can I optimally use all four ports, right? And all that this is saying is, in a two-dimensional mesh, you may be able to find multiple different ways of getting the data into the same destination. Right? which may not have been so easy using either a crossbar or a shared bus kind of approach. Okay. So with all of that in mind, let's sort of, uh, uh, just before we get to the actual metrics, uh, slightly closer look at what is a crossbar and why it is called that. It's effectively saying that, you know, you have a complete switching matrix over here. So let's say that input two wanted to communicate with output five, that would essentially be the way that it follow, right? And at the same time, three could talk to four, right? That could go on, let's use a different color, three could talk to four, okay? And somebody else could talk, let's say four could talk to six, right? All of these things can happen. Essentially what happens is there are switching points and each switching point can be set to either continue in the direction that the data was coming in or switch it to a different direction. And based on that, we can essentially have a so-called crossbar connection. This was pretty much the structure used in the original telephone networks, right? You literally had a crossbar and the telephone operator needed to make the connections between different points in the crossbar to establish a call from a person who's calling to the recipient, okay? Nowadays, of course, the way that switching happens is slightly different, but the underlying concept of a crossbar basically allows you to do certain things such as connecting multiple things at the same time. Okay. The cost is obviously high. There are M into N switch 
locations over here right which means that it's very difficult to get this to scale as m and n increase right the number of intermediate values that you need to store over here can grow quite dramatically an alternative that is used to that is something called a multi stage interconnection network i have n input ports m output ports what will essentially happen is that i could for example have a connection that looks something like this let's say that i wanted to go from 1 to 5 right one way of doing it could be that i will go through this and over here i will switch down to this side i will then uh, sorry uh, the other way uh, the switching actually happens over here then this one would go through this could go down here go through this and this could go down here this might be one way by which one could reach 5 right similarly 3 could go to 2 by going through something like this right what is effectively happening over here is you have multiple stages so the total number of switching points that are required may not be m into n there are ways of designing these intermediate switching blocks switching stages such that the overall complexity of this multi-stage network becomes much less than m into n it allows you in the best case to actually get complete m cross n connectivity right but there can be situations where you are not able to establish a connection even though the normal crossbar might have permitted it okay so you sacrifice some amount of flexibility for a more compact or easier to design implementation okay so now let's look at some of the node metrics that are used in order to measure the quality of different topologies one of them is so called node degree easy to understand it basically says how many adjacent nodes am I connected to so in this case I can see that node 0 for example is connected to 1 here and 1 here so degree is 2 in the ring structure right in the octagon I have 3 and in the complete crossbar I will have 7 because I am connected to everybody else right so in some ways what would you say about node degree what is desirable higher the better right so the higher the node degree the better because it means that i have more choices in terms of where to send the data next okay but from a hardware point of view higher may not be good from a communication point of view higher is good one very important term that is used in understanding networks is the so called bisection bandwidth right bisection is essentially saying i need to take the graph corresponding to the connectivity and find a cut set similar to what we were talking about during pipelining right i need to find a cut set a set of edges that if i remove them will split the graph into two uh, two parts not necessarily equal halves right just two parts two separate completely disjoint parts okay and a minimal set of edges so of course if i remove all the edges it breaks it into more than two parts that's not particularly meaningful if i can find a minimal set of edges such that if i remove them it will break it into two parts or if i add any one of those edges back it is no longer disjoint okay that is a cut set so i can identify cut sets in this case the cut sets again are obvious you can see over here that one possible cut set is this vertical line going through between uh, 0 to 7 and uh, 3 to 4 right what is the bisection bandwidth is essentially the aggregate bandwidth that essentially forms the cut across those lines ok so what happens over here is supposing I call this the connection between 0 to 7 as one link bandwidth 3 to 4 is another link bandwidth the total bisection bandwidth in this case that is the total bandwidth of that cut set is twice the link bandwidth okay typically what we are interested in is what is the worst case bisection bandwidth for a graph so which is that worst cut set which will give us the smallest bandwidth 
in the examples that I've given here, they're all identical, right? They're completely symmetric graphs. So bisection bandwidth for whichever such uh, cut that you take pretty much works out to be the same. In the case of the octagon, it's interesting what happens is in order to bisect, I actually need to cut a whole lot of edges. If I add it up, I'll find that it is actually six times the link bandwidth. Okay. So this is interesting. Effectively, what it's telling you is the bisection bandwidth in some way is a measure of how many distinct nodes can talk to each other at the same time. Right? Because effectively what happens is the moment zero is talking to seven, it's as though that link has gone from the network. Nobody else can use it. Okay. But if there is some other way by which one can talk to six, then that's good. One can still continue talking to six. Right? Even though zero and seven are blocked, I can't go through that route. Okay. The crossbar, once again, as you might expect, gives you the best possible, the bandwidth, 16 times the link bandwidth in this case. Another metric is something called the network diameter, which basically tells you if I have a large network, many nodes, what is the worst case number of hops? Okay. So a hop in this case comes about, the notion of a hop comes about because we are saying that data is not directly going from source to destination. It is being transmitted through a bunch of intermediate nodes. Right. And in this case, the worst case that I could have is that I need to go from somewhere here through all of these links to get to this point. Okay. So the worst case would basically work out to be 14 hops. I would need to jump through. This is an eight by eight mesh. So seven hops to get to one end, another seven hops to get to the other vertical end. Okay. 14 hops, no matter which way you look, right? Pretty much any way that you try to get through this, the best case scenario is that I need to do 14 hops to get from, in this case, A to B. Right? Now, uh, you can come up with variants of that, right? Which basically say that I can think of something called a concentrated mesh. A concentrated mesh is essentially saying I will take four of these together and essentially maybe give them a common buffer for data. Right? So now what happens? How do I measure the time taken to get from A to B? I essentially need to hop from here to here, here to here, here to here, then here, here and here. Internally, I don't care. I only need to worry about the higher level granularity. How do I get data from one end to the other? That happens, for example, if these four are able to share a common buffer for the data, for example. right? Obviously, there's a trade-off. It now means that there are four of them are going to be fighting for that buffer. So if those four then want to continuously transmit data, once again, that might become a bottleneck, but at least the number of hops can be reduced. Okay. There are vari many variants on this, right? What is happening over here is that you actually have this concept of long links. Right. So a long link will essentially potentially give you the ability to go directly from one end to the other. Right? Similar to what we had in that octagon case where we provided a shortcut from one end of the graph to the other. Right? So those kind of hops are possible in or rather in, in this case it's called a flattened butterfly structure but in any case you can come up with variants or ideas of your own of how to create those kind of longer hops. Right? The problem is why, why did we bring about the idea of a network on chip in the first place? We wanted to avoid long wires, right? So this obviously once again becomes an engineering trade-off, right? You want to reduce the number of hops so that the communication is better. But on the other hand, having long wires will require more buffers. It will require repeaters. It will require larger driver capacity, driver uh, transistors, more capacitance to deal with, maybe more power consumption, right? So as usual in any other problem in design, it's an engineering trade-off that you need to come up with. Okay, so that takes care of the metrics that we are usually interested in to understand the different kinds of uh, network on chip topologies, right? Now let's look at the implementation aspects. Yeah. Yeah. All the nodes are interconnected. No, no. So. For example, you would need to have a long link between the 
concentrated mesh that is the group of nodes and the other group of nodes so if we have from uh, this corner to the rightmost corner yeah so what about the in between cells like uh, how, uh, how will, how will well you will need to have connections to those also yeah so uh, that's the problem right i mean it essentially says if i want to communicate from here to here i need another link and possibly also i might need something so then it becomes a question do you really provide links here also this becomes a question mark do i really need to do this or not or do i just say that i'll go to the other end and then hop back from there okay so that's my point i mean you can make uh, it's not that this is one standard topology all that it's saying is by introducing the idea of long wires you could potentially shorten the distances to other things the trade off is the long wires will have problems of their own right so the design of these things is like i mentioned last time it comes down to this problem of so called small world networks right how quickly can i reach my destination where are the places where i should provide those shortcuts to get the best impact okay. all right so all of that was regard to the was uh, regarding the physical topology and the connectivity of the graph now let's look at how it gets implemented right there are a few issues with regard to the actual implementation that we need to think about the first one is with regard to routing algorithms so you will see over here that i'm talking about routing and switching as two separate things right and that's intentional routing in general means what path should data take in order to get from a to b right whereas switching is a much more local strategy question it's just at a given node if i see a piece of data coming in what should i do with it should i send it uh, north south east west right so typically switching strategies are sort of more local routing strategies build on top of them okay so routing strategies are in one uh, sort of a slightly higher level of abstraction than switching and finally there is also the concept of flow control which we'll get to at the end so right now let's look at routing the idea in routing is how do i select a path from a source to a destination in a given topology okay so let's start by what would we consider a good routing algorithm what are desirable characteristics of a good routing algorithm even right. even if there are uh, non uniform traffic patterns that is data needs to be i mean you know uh, there is some sudden burst of data that is coming from one source going to one particular destination or something else is happening that suddenly requires more bandwidth to be given to one particular uh, node or element i should be able to handle that right i should be able to balance the load and spread it out among all the links ideally minimize the latency it's fine if you you know on the one hand it's good to say yeah i will always make sure that data gets from a to b but if that data getting from a to b is after a too long a duration it may simply not be acceptable right the other thing which is highly desirable is can you tolerate faults okay now fault tolerance in normal digital design in a shared bus design for example we very rarely think about faults occurring in the system right that's usually an afterthought right while designing the system itself we assume that wires gates modules that are built up using those are all flawless okay meaning that they work exactly as they were intended to always the problem is that's not always how systems work things can go wrong even a wire can overheat melt get disconnected right and gates of course can have other kinds of problems associated with them once again related to you know it might be that one particular connection or there uh, degraded with age or with heating right there are other kind lots of effects that can either show up as faults as soon as the system is built or come up later okay in actual digital circuits what's usually done is very often in most of the things that we use right if a chip fails you replace the chip right you pretty much have to take it for repair and get it replaced in more and more complex systems you can't really afford to do that so you will find that there will be some kind of testing that is done in order to identify faults and maybe just work around them statically work around them right so you might for example know about how when you look at intel processors you have processors that work at different speeds and you know they cost different amounts of money bottom line right why is that 
it's not as though they are actually building things intentionally to cost different amounts of money what they do is they just build a large number of chips then figure out okay some of these have problems in this cache memory disable that cache memory and sell it at a lower cost okay so it's essentially yield related what happens is there are problems that come in they are statically fixed meaning that at one time i run a test check whether there is a problem just disable that part of the chip and sell it what we are talking about here is can you tolerate faults at run time are there ways by which you can actually figure out that something has gone wrong and work around it okay now taxonomy basically classification right there are a few different ways of looking at routing algorithms one of them the word that is used is oblivious basically meaning that it does not care about the state of the network oblivious means it does not look into detail in of the, at the internal state of what is happening the routing algorithm is just based on something else that does not look at what is happening at each individual node in much detail okay even within oblivious algorithms you have two variants one of them is so called deterministic and the other is randomized right and then there are adaptive algorithms that will actually change how they behave they can even adapt based on the state of the network traffic okay so an example of an oblivious algorithm is something called 2d xy routing this is something called dimension ordered routing essentially what it says is the x dimension is given a higher order a uh, higher priority than the y dimension so let's say that i want to transmit from this node 20 in the bottom right to node 11 which is somewhere in the middle of the network i'll first go along x which means i need to go minus 1 in the x direction and then plus 1 in the y direction okay and i will end up getting to my destination okay a torus allows you to do a bit more than that it says that i now have two possible routes i can go this way or i can go this way right so from 10 i can also directly jump to 13 if necessary in other words right because there is a direct connection between the two okay now one possible problem that you could encounter in such a situation is every node is essentially going to do x first routing then y okay what if two nodes over here simultaneously try to transfer data to 13 okay how do you handle such a situation because after all each node is only looking at its immediate state and trying to send data okay both of them are trying to send data to 13 what should happen you this is a situation called deadlock right at its very basic this is a already you have hit deadlock right it's as though two people are basically trying to get through the door both of them come at exactly the same time you don't know what to do right if both of them just say okay no i need to get through the door and i'm not going to give way you are stuck that's deadlock how do you resolve it one of them has to give way one of them steps back says okay you first right that can go the problem is what if both step back and both are equally polite right so both packets over here in this case both sources back off and say okay i'll try again after one clock cycle after one clock cycle nothing has changed right so they can keep on trying to hit each other over here and end up in deadlock right there are of course these are problems that have been studied for like more than 40 years or so in the area of networking theory itself which is why of course the network on chip idea became popular right because the entire theory of how to study networks and what kind of network protocols to use was already there if you can bring it down to a chip level there are so much theory that you can build up on so how do you handle that there are many ways you know you do different randomized back off exponential back off each one or you just send the data somewhere else etc right there are ways of resolving deadlock in other words in this case yeah and so what i mentioned over here is a deterministic variant which basically says that i will always try to go along x then go along y right you could look at randomized variants where they try to go in different orders based on some random condition at each node okay the 
other possibility is to overall sort of spread the traffic around what if i want to sort of you know the case that i showed with the mesh where everybody is trying to talk to six and everyone finally ends up getting to six through different ports would just this xy routing be able to achieve that possibly not so what i could do instead is maybe say that for everybody that wants to talk to some destination a right you first send your packets to some random location and then from there try sending it to a and pick that random location at random right so how does that help it has actually been shown that that helps to spread the traffic around the network a lot more cleanly and can prevent bottlenecks from forming or at least can avoid the formation of bottlenecks in many cases right obviously it has drawbacks of its own we are not going to get into those right now adaptive routing on the other hand is trying to introduce some intelligence into the problem of routing right you need to have some sense of the network state so it's no longer oblivious it's not sort of saying i don't care what is happening at the next node i need to know something about what is happening around me in the rest of the network right the problem is it's very difficult to get a global picture for what's happening around the network what you can get is local information so for example when i'm sitting over here at 00, 00 i can easily sense the amount of traffic on my immediate neighbors right that is this link and this link i know how much traffic is there right and based on that i can then decide which link is better to send data out onto right so in this particular case i want to go from 10 to 13 the normal routing order would simply say i don't have a delta x at all so just send it along 111213 11, the problem is this link is congested congested meaning there is already traffic going on between 11 and 12 okay so what do you do you route around it and you go here okay why was that possible because one one had information about its neighbors it knew that the one two link was crowded so it sent the data on to two one and from there i proceeded continued with the xy routing protocol two one was able to send it up to two two then go back to one two and then from there go to one three okay the problem is imagine a situation where for example you have something like this I'm not sure how clearly it's visible at this distance but 01 to 02 is slightly congested whereas 11 to 12 and 21 to 22 are heavily congested right but what happened 01 looks at its local information it sees that 01 to 02 is congested 01 to 11 is not it promptly sends the data in that direction but that's only made it worse right if you have tried driving with google maps in heavy traffic conditions you will see that this actually happens in practice right it sometimes tell you okay fine you know this road ahead of you is congested take a turning over here and you end up far worse off than you were so again same story right internet networks networks on chip traffic all the same thing but bottom line is adaptive routing is not going to solve all your problems it can create problems of its own <coughs> how does routing get implemented right how do you actually implement this in practice there are many variants uh one of uh, broadly you can classify them as table based and algorithmic table based essentially means that i just need to look up something in order to know where to go next okay within that there are a few variants the source routed variant effectively says the source that is trying to send out the data will give the routing information all the way up to the destination okay so that's interesting it's sort of like saying that if i want to go from here to ananagar the map is straight away going to tell me right now okay you know take this road take the left over here get on to this road go there go there go there and tell me all the way up to my destination it's a static route which was determined at my source and i'm just going to follow that what's the good part about it following instructions is very easy i don't need to think i just get to each intersection what does the instruction tell me go straight turn left turn right follow that so the implementation becomes very easy right 
the problem is it cannot adapt at all because the source doesn't really get a global picture of what's happening it doesn't even get picture of any congestion that's happening later okay on the other hand supposing i say that at every traffic intersection the policeman is basically going to tell you whether to go straight or left or right and you just blindly follow instructions right you can or rather one slightly better thing is you go there and ask the policeman i want to get to ananagar how should i go they'll probably tell you okay right now this road is crowded you take the left next intersection again the person you ask over there and then they tell you where to go that's each router needs to store information about its local uh you know the congestion but also needs to know that if i want to get to ananagar how do i go about doing it right so how do i get to a certain destination this is the kind of stuff that's done in the internet protocol for example right i mean there are routers that maintain global level routing tables right which broadly tell you that if you want to send a packet of data to somewhere in the us you need to essentially go through these kind of hops but that's about it the detailed routing is probably at a different level the good thing is they can adapt because these routing tables can be <coughs> updated the problem is it's also harder to scale because when there are more nodes in the network the routing tables become larger okay algorithmic routers are ones where you say i will actually do a computation to figure out which way to route i will have some kind of logic that gets implemented which basically takes certain inputs the inputs could be the state of congestion maybe a few other things and actually have some logic that will finally give me a value that value will say which port which output port of the router to send the data on okay nice in its own way you don't have big lookup tables but then how do you come up with that logic function that's another question okay so that's the end of the routing part of it let's now look at switching strategies okay try and understand a bit more about what is involved in switching switching essentially refers to the problem of how are network resources allocated to data data that needs to be transferred obviously broadly there are two classes of switching circuit switching and packet switching right virtual circuits are sort of a combination of both they are circuits that are built up on the concept of packet switching right again those of you who have done a course in communication networks telephony any of that you would know exactly what this mean it's exactly the same concepts being used over here right what happens in circuit switching is that i'm going to establish a dedicated connection between in this case 03 and 11 okay so in order to establish that connection i need to have at least two traversals right from 03 i somehow send a packet all the way up to 11 saying i want to talk to you 11 then responds saying okay i am free and you know goes back along this line now everything over there 03 02 01 and 11 are now dedicated to this link nobody else is allowed to use them okay it's it has all that setup overhead which basically says that you know once you have done this after that comes the second part where you actually transfer the data okay the good thing about it is contention free transmission for the duration of that circuit all the links over there are dedicated to this particular circuit the problem is you can end up with fairly low resource utilization and you have overhead associated with this you basically have latency because you take some time in order to set up the circuit right and the bandwidth also is being used up for this circuit switching to set up the connection at least after you have done the setting up of the connection those connections are the links are dedicated therefore it's no further overheads at that point right this is effectively what happens when you are making a telephone call right you dial a certain number it establishes a connection to that end and then it guarantees that there is actually all the packets being all the data being sent by you is going to reach that other end and their responses are going to get to you okay packet switching on the other hand takes another approach it says that i will take data and break it up into packets this is what happens for example on the internet right and the packets can be independently transmitted to the destination possibly along separate routes 
there's really no startup time required over here because I don't need that back and forth for setting up a circuit. I just as soon as I have data, I start sending it out. And the routing tables that, or whatever the routing approach that I'm following will take care of finally getting it to the destination. The problem with packet switching is there is something called quality of service. A circuit switched connection guarantees a quality of service. It means that all links over there are now dedicated to your communication. Nothing else is going to happen. Whereas over here, each packet is handled independently. Okay, There are a few variants of packet switching. One of them is called store and forward switching. Right? What happens in store and forward is A is receiving a packet that it knows needs to be sent to B. It waits until it gets the entire packet, stores it locally. Right? Ask B if it is ready. B acknowledges saying yes and then A sends the packet to B. Okay? In one way this is good because what is happening is A ensures that it receives the packet properly. It sends the packet to B only when B is ready to accept it. So as and when B is ready to accept it, the entire packet should go through without any further problems. The issue is the size of this packet. Right? What if the packet is quite large? A needs to store the entire packet before it can even start transmission. Which means that potentially it can end up requiring large buffers. Okay. A variant of this is a slightly sort of optimistic approach to the problem which says that as soon as A starts getting data and it knows that it is meant for B, it immediately contacts B and says, I have something coming for you. Shall I start sending it? Okay. B says, okay. Right. And A starts forwarding the data immediately. The good thing is A now needs to store only this much, not the entire packet. Okay. The That sounds good to start with. The problem is now you are breaking that original packet up into some smaller units that are being sent or at least you have started sending the data even before the entire packet came through. Right? What if at some point after that B suddenly says hey wait a minute wait a minute I just missed a few bytes over here. A still has to store the entire packet. Okay? Because it's got a knack that is a negative acknowledgement and it then needs to send the entire thing back. Okay? So virtual cut through the one thing it definitely reduces is the latency because what happened in the original case over here store and forward is the entire packet has to come to A only then the transmission to B even starts there's a huge latency involved whereas over here as soon as the packet arrives over here you start forwarding it okay it reduces latency it may not necessarily reduce storage so much especially if you have to have this retransmit on negative acknowledgement Beyond that, we essentially bring in this concept of a flit, right? What we are saying is, I have a packet, but even a packet which might have been suitable for, let's say, you know, an Ethernet packet, for example, can be up to 1500 bytes or so, right? Whereas the kind of packets that I might want to transfer when I'm sending data around inside a chip, maybe I want to send smaller packets, right? So what you do is take packets and break them up into something smaller called flow control units, usually referred to as flits. Okay. So a flit is essentially a fixed size small packet. You can, in principle, it's also a packet, right? What you end up with is taking the entire packet and breaking it up into a header flit, which has some control signals over here to show that it's a header then a large number of data flits which have a different set of control bits and finally a tail flit to show that this is the end of that packet. Okay. Now potentially all that you have done is you have replaced packets with flits but now flits are of fixed size. You don't have to worry about having different sized packets. You are always going to transfer a fixed size flit and therefore you can do some slight optimizations to your switching and routing algorithms based on that information. Right. In particular, there is something called the flit buffer switching, also called wormhole switching. Sometimes wormhole routing is also used, but switching is probably the more accurate term in this context, right? Basically what it says is as soon as A receives a flit of data, 
it asks B if it's ready and sends it on, right? So effectively what is happening is that you need less data to be stored hopefully than store and forward because you are now effectively buffering only the flits, right? The problem of course is all that you have done is you have taken some packet that you might have had and broken it down into smaller packets. So it's still packet based. Right? The main advantage over here is the fact that the flit size is fixed and it is relatively small. So based on that you get a little bit more flexibility in terms of how to store etc. Okay, so this brings us to the last part of the principles of network on chip, at least the things required to understand it, which is something called flow control. Okay, so what does flow control refer to? Essentially, it's saying what happens when traffic is encountered, right? What if you are not able to send data on a link? This term over here, back pressure, right, is a very important term for you to keep in mind because you will be using it extensively even while designing the modules that you are going to use for your project or you know any of the further stages. Effectively, what back pressure says is there should be some way by which, I mean, normally what I have is a communication that goes from A to B to C. What if C is blocked? It's not able to send its output anywhere or it's not able to store its output. It needs to be able to send a buffer full signal backwards, which basically indicates to B, don't send any more data. That in turn indicates to A, don't send any more data. Okay. If there is indefinite back pressure, you'll start losing data because A can't hold its data indefinitely, right? But if it has a buffer, some place where it can keep data for a little while, it might be that this block will clear and then you can again start sending the data through. Okay. So this back pressure is a very crucial component of getting complex multi-element systems to work properly together, right? How do you implement back pressure? That essentially is the concept of flow control. Okay. There are multiple ways by which we can do this. One of them is so called ACNAC uh, approach, right? The simplest way that we can think about it is something like this. I basically have A trying to talk to B, right? I send a packet and receive the ACK, then send the next data, receive the ACK and so on. Okay, So this is the timeline, I basically send data, receive acknowledgement, send data, receive acknowledgement and go on. Right? The problem is major loss in throughput because effectively what will happen over here if as I go down the timeline is that this is useful, this is wasted because I'm just waiting for the ACK to come through. This is useful, this is wasted, right? Wasted or if you want to be positive, you can just say you're waiting, right? So your effective throughput, the bandwidth with which you can send data has reduced considerably. The optimistic way of doing this is to say, as you can imagine, right? Send data, send data, send data, send data, right? And finally, this one sends an ACK, right? So all this becomes useful and this becomes waiting, right? Overhead reduced. But what happens if at some point B wanted to send back a negative acknowledgement? I did not receive a packet. Of course, what this means is that each packet has to have some ID associated with it so that B can actually know whether it received all the packets or not, right? And then it basically sends back saying, I did not receive one particular packet, okay? So when the NAC goes back, you then need to retransmit, okay? So this whole business of how big of a buffer should A keep 
what should it keep track of as soon as it receives an acknowledgement for a particular packet it can flush everything before that right but then i need to make sure that i don't transmit anything beyond the end of that buffer i might need to slow down and wait until i get acknowledgements or just keep on retrying until i do that okay so acnac based approaches are fairly simple to implement right but they have these things that they require certain buffer sizes you need to store the data until you get all the acknowledgements and so on okay another variant of this is something called credit based switching right which is once again trying to solve the same problem what it's saying is you know i don't want to wait for acknowledgements on every single thing i want to give this transmitter some amount of credit or buffering basically saying okay you can transmit so many things to me at one shot right and i will let you know at some point if something is going wrong in this case what it says is this is the transmitter this is the receiver right the transmitter currently has two credits from the receiver okay so what does it do it can send two flits or two elements of data across right as and when each one is sent the number of credits you can see over here reduces right and at this point the receive buffer is full and the number of credits has gone down to zero which means that the transmitter automatically stops okay on the receive side as soon as it it popped out this h and sent back one credit that got updated over here okay it popped out the b and sent back another credit but this and this transmission of t happened at the same time so the number of credits remains at 1 as far as the transmitter is concerned okay and then afterwards this one sends back one more so by this point you should see that the number of credits has gone back to 2 okay so yeah after this what you would see is basically that uh, t would be sitting over here and then t would get popped off in this case right it's simplifying the acnac implementation but if you think about it really there is no nac that's coming back over here there is no negative acknowledgement saying i did not receive a particular packet all that it's saying is you can continue to send packets and at least my buffer is not full right so i'm reducing it to the simpler case where i'm only talking about the buffer part alone okay another variant of flow control is the so called on off flow control over here you just have one buffer which basically says it has a on threshold and an off threshold as long as i'm below the on threshold keep on sending data the moment i go above the off threshold stop sending data wait go into the stop mode and just stop sending data okay simple because the signaling between two blocks is just two wires right stop and go right in fact one wire with different states or you could have multiple wires to indicate the different levels of the buffer right the point is all of these different techniques can be used in order to implement various forms of flow control the most important thing to keep in mind is although i said that you know you can benefit from a lot of the theory of networks trying to implement those complicated network protocols on a chip is almost certainly a bad idea because in software you can allocate buffers you can store data you can retransmit you just have like some if statements over there but in hardware all that translates into more and more gates more area more capacitance more power consumed right more cost much more than what it would be in the software so that's why all of these different techniques are sort of going more towards a hardware friendly way of implementing things yeah because yeah in principle you need not have an on threshold you can basically say you know uh any time i have data send it right but effectively what it's saying over here is sort of the other way around let's say that incoming flits are pouring in right going in over here right if i fill up to get to this point over here f of right above the off threshold stop so that's basically the where the back pressure will go and say tell the previous unit to stop the problem is let's say that i drop below that and immediately the other unit starts sending data again 
right? Potentially, I might end up with the situation where I'm just sitting over here, turning it on, off, on, off, on, off. Instead, what we say is I'll provide a slight hysteresis, right? Let the other side clear out some data, right? To prevent this sort of jumping between stop and go continuously, right? So when I turn off the signal, I leave it off for a short amount of time so that the buffer gets time to clear a little bit so that when I reactivate it, it can accept more data. It's not absolutely necessary. You could just have one threshold. It will still work, but you can potentially end up with that sort of bouncing state. You know, I clear a data, immediately one new data comes in. Once again, I go into stop. So I'm going on losing cycles each time that happens. So the last thing is some issues that come up in the concept, uh, in the context of understanding this. One of them is called deadlock. I told you already about deadlock, two things coming together at the same time. Usually that happens also in the case of circular dependencies, right? Let's say that four units or, you know, or the ideal situation is two units trying to talk to each other, right? This is trying to send some data. The other one is trying to send some data back. This has already sent part of the data and filled up the buffer over here. So it can't continue sending the data. It is still stuck over here. This one is not able to. So A, uh, B is not able to send the data because once again, it is waiting for something that is coming from A, right? So deadlock can happen in that kind of situation. It can even happen in the case of the flit based routing, right? There are examples where you can show that it can lead to deadlock if you're not careful about how you do it. Live lock is a more interesting scenario, more, well, you don't want it to happen, but it's something that can actually come up in these kind of routing uh, uh, scenarios. In particular, there is one technique called hot potato routing. Hot potato routing essentially says, somebody is passing you a hot potato, you don't have time to hold on to it, you just want to give it to somebody else as quickly as possible, right? So what is the switching strategy used over there? Each switch doesn't sort of wait for its neighbors to see which one is free or rather, you know, whether the correct one the, where it needs to go is free. It just looks around, whichever one is free, it sends it there. Okay. Hopefully over time, it will make its way to the correct destination. It's not as bad as that. There is obviously some more to it. But the idea is that you don't need any local storage. You don't need buffering. The problem you can end up with is live lock where packets keep going round and round the network without reaching their destination. Okay. And finally, starvation. We already talked about this in the context of priorities, right? In the bandwidth on a shared bus. You can just end up with some nodes that are not able to communicate. Why? Because of whatever some aspect of the routing protocol that you chose. Okay. So these are all more serious issues that come up in the context of uh, implementation of these things. There is a whole huge literature in the context of NOCs that you can go into if you are interested. But as far as we are concerned, we are stopping here with that. Okay. All right. Thank you.